My grandfather was a mystery to me. He immigrated to America from Eastern Europe. I remember in my heart when you said we had to part. Now my dreams are fading in the blue, cause I'm still in love with you. My mom said that he had a very hard life. His English wasn't very good, and when I was a kid, we didn't have much of a relationship. Unfortunately, he died when I was young. I never really got to know him. Decades later, I was scrolling through my Facebook feed and came upon a post featuring a song that my grandfather had written and performed. I was blown away. My late grandfather was a musician and a songwriter? I had to learn more before it was too late. This podcast is dedicated to discovering my grandfather and the musical side of him that I never knew existed. This is My Grandfather's Secret Life in Music. I'll be loving you till the day. Welcome to my grandfather's secret life in music. My name is Jason Morris. In this episode, I'm going to interview Steve Van Kirk. Steve is a fellow musician and has recorded a lot of music over the years. He's also the guy who posted my grandfather's song on Facebook, which inspired this entire podcast. The song is called I Remember in My Heart. And when I heard it recently for the first time, I was blown away. It's a rough recording, but it's haunting, and it really got to me. Steve will take us back to that day in 1975 when he and my grandfather Tony sat down to record it. He will also tell us about his special relationship with my grandfather over the years, including a special moment they had right before his death. Next, we talk with Steve Ann Kirk on my grandfather's secret life in music. Hi, is this Steve? Yes, it is. Hey, Steve. Yeah, how's it going, man? It's going good. I really appreciate you doing this, and I I hope that you could shed some light on my late grandfather's musical side. You posted a music video on Facebook that featured a song written and sung by my late grandfather. How did you get this music? So the word had gotten out, as I had uh, posted on my Facebook page, that I had a reel-to-reel recorder. And uh, he very much wanted to record the song. I was adept at setting up the microphones and uh, running it through uh, preamp and getting it down on tape. I had a little experience doing that. So he stopped by. My grandfather, back at this time, I believe your post said it was around 1975. He must have been in like his mid-60s. How old were you at the time and how did you know my grandfather? Oh, my gosh. I think I was uh, probably 22 in 1975. I knew your grandfather because, uh, well, we lived on the same road, the same street. And uh, my best friend growing up, Steve Miyamoto, and I had decided we'd want to form a band. Back in the late 60s, uh, just about every guy going into junior high and high school wanted to form a band and learn to play guitar like the Beatles. Alan, at the time, uh, your uncle, didn't play guitar, and uh, he just made a decision to take up bass because we needed a bass player to form the band. Tony had aspired Alan to become a professional violinist, and Alan was taking violin, and I believe was playing in in the school band. So when he took up bass guitar, Tony was not happy about that. Uh, He was very serious about Alan becoming a professional musician, violinist, to perhaps play in a symphony orchestra. 
So sometimes when he would come to the door, he would say to me, uh, well, Alan is not home. Well, I had just spoken to Alan on the telephone. <laughs> he was just saying, oh, Alan is not here. Very sorry. It was almost like, you know, you guys were into the Beatles and you had this band with my uncle and his father is basically saying, I want my son to be a serious violinist and not a bassist and not be in your band. Exactly. So he would tell you guys um, that Alan wasn't around, huh? Jeez. <laughs> he was not a fan of the Beatles at that time. Uh, it, was, it was more of a personal thing. It wasn't anything to do with the music or the talent that the Beatles had and the, the quality of the music or anything like that. It was just simply that it was a distraction. It was not part of the plan. So uh, he was basically against it. He was not happy about it at all. So just jumping ahead now to 1975, we had already formed our band, The Blank Expression, and uh, we had uh, recorded some of our practices and some of our original material on the Sony Reel to Reel. So Tony knew about this. I believe he called, and I was surprised to hear from him. You know? And he stopped by, and uh, with him he had a record of a pianist who had previously recorded the piano part for the song. So uh, it was that that was a little bit of a surprise. I didn't know he was bringing the record. So I had there my uh, acoustic research turntable. Uh, I'm an audiophile, so I had good equipment. And uh, drew the record on the turntable and put it into the left channel of the Sony reel-to-reel -reel and uh, hooked up a, I would believe it was a, the microphone I had at the time was actually a pretty good one. It's a Sony ECM-220 electric condenser microphone that I set up for Tony right there and just simply uh, fed it directly. I think I did directly into the Sony uh, microphone input right there on the right channel. So basically the reel-to-reel -reel could record um, two channels separately? It wasn't a professional model. It was just simply, uh, it, the exact model was a Sony PC255, reel-to-reel. It's a consumer model. That's why there's noise in the recording. It's not a professional level 8-deck. It's just two channels, two tracks only. No mixing boards, no multi-track, nothing complicated. Very simple setup. Just him with the microphone and uh, the record playing. Uh, and he sang along to the piano accompaniment. I believe in your post you mentioned that you recorded at the farmhouse. Is that your house? Or? That's right, yes. Yeah, that was my home. So your childhood home was the place where you guys recorded the song. Can you kind of describe, like, the setup? Like, you know, basically where the gear was. Were you in the room with my grandfather? Was there anybody else with you guys? You know, that kind of a thing? My mom happened to be there. Being that it was a big deal that uh, Tony had shown up, my sister was there, Debbie. So they were in attendance, and uh, we're right there. We did it in the living room on the first floor, not the second floor, where we did all of our band work. We were down in the living room. Now, that's a good thing because the acoustics are really, really good there for recording. Uh, for recording someone, it's better to have what's referred to as a bedroom in other words, there's no echo or very little echo in the room. So there was a wall-to-wall -wall carpet laid down, furnished, and uh, my bookshelf stereo with my gear set up on the back wall. So it was the perfect place. So Tony just simply, I, I sat him down on the sofa, and he was seated as he sang the song and just handheld the microphone. So you basically... Uh... You'd have your microphone and your reel-to-reel. -reel. Mm -hmm. You'd uh, hit record, press play on, on the um, record player, and then he would just sing to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow, it's, it's amazing because I, I had wondered if there like, were overdubs or anything because even the recording to me actually sounds pretty impressive. It, there are no overdubs whatsoever. Uh, he sang it in one take. Wow. Yep. We did, we did no retakes. Thank you. 
Cause I'm still in love with you I remember in my heart When we parted night was blue Stars were shiny and the moon was high When How did the the session end, and and did he walk away with something, or how how did that all work? I made him a copy of the recording. I have the master. It must have been a cassette copy. When you posted it on Facebook, is that from the original reel-to-reel, or was that from the cassette? That is from my cassette copy. The original reel-to-reel, I have not not set up to master my original tapes. But what I posted on Facebook is a copy on cassette, therefore the additional noise that's on the tape. What's called tape piss. The original source would definitely not be as noisy and would sound better. That scratchiness or the hiss maybe gave it some character. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And you're so right about that. The piano sounds so old. It sounds, Alan and I used to joke about it after we made the recording. And I would uh, uh, jokingly mention to Alan, I said, yeah, that piano part, it sounds like something from the 1800s. And he would laugh and we would both laugh about that. You had this recording from 1975 of my grandfather. You didn't just post the audio, but you made like a music video out of it using these images. I gathered some photos from Romania in order to create an air of an Eastern European feel. That was pretty fascinating, too, when I I saw it. It kind of, uh, you know, it added a whole new dimension to the song, but it also showed that you really cared about it, you know, that you took the time to to do that. That is true. That is true. Uh... It's it's personal to me in a few regards. Uh, first of all, that I came to know your grandfather later in his life, during the 90s, when I would stop by to visit Alan, and uh, sometimes Alan wouldn't be home. So, guess who I visited with? Tony. We'd sit outside at the picnic table, and we'd chat about everything under the sun, just talk about life. At one point, uh, he mentioned reflecting back to 1967 when Alan was taking violin lessons 
and uh, at that time that he wasn't approving of uh, Alan uh, getting involved in a rock band and playing Beatles songs. There was no future in that, you know, and he was right uh, in many regards. So he he said, just out of the blue, he goes, do you know, Steve? He says, I like the Beatles. And he, seeing the expression on my face, the surprise, the expression of surprise, <laughs> he added, uh, does that surprise you? <laughs> and I said, yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> and he grinned ear to ear, and he added, yes, it's true. <laughs> so all along, yes, your grandfather liked the Beatles. Wow, that's so funny when you think that he would basically tell you when you'd go over to find my uncle to uh, have band practice that he wasn't around, even though he was, because he thought the Beatles were a distraction. That's awesome. Yes. Do you think, too, that, you know, one of the reasons that you guys were able to be friendly like that was because you had this relationship where you took the time back in 1975 to record him? Uh, yeah, that, I think that was part of it. We didn't mention that specifically. I don't know why we did not, but uh, that's another reason. Another part of the answer was, first of all, that I I've come to know Tony. And we became friends, and I found him to be very kind and uh, charismatic, keen sense of humor. The other part of, that makes the re recording personal to me is that the song itself, the lyrics, they, they speak to me personally. When I listened to it for the first time, I found it on a backup cassette and played it. And as today, I was in awe, thinking, this is really good. Wow. I can't believe that he sang it so well. I cannot believe that uh, it actually recorded as well as it did. That's good enough to sit down and enjoy, you know, listening to. The song is very special to me, and it is personal, yes. Do you know what he planned on, on doing with that recording? I think his dream was mostly that somebody would pick up on the song and make it into something more, you know, more than just his own recording. So did you guys ever end up recording any other songs together? No, that's the only one. In fact, uh, I almost forgot to mention that uh, when your grandfather was very ill, I do not know what the nature of his illness was, but uh, he was in bad shape. And um, George and Alan and I were working on the Hail and Rain project and just about finishing up on that. When I mentioned to George, I'll remember in my heart, and that Tony was very sick, and uh, he was there, and uh, that, you know, during his lifetime, he would probably prefer that somebody picked up on the song and recorded it. So that's what we did. George sang the song. I accompanied on guitar, and I have that recording somewhere in my Reel to Reel archives, and must dig that up. Alan had given the tape either to uh, Denise, your grandmother, or someone to bring to him. And uh, it was said that he played it over and over, could not stop listening to it, and that he was greatly affected by it, and uh, was very, very pleased that we had recorded the song. Wow. I think that the fact that he was so happy about George and myself recording the song and passing that on to him before he passed away, that he was so greatly appreciative of that. And uh, I think some you know, satisfaction and maybe, maybe some degree of completion. Yeah. I wonder, you know, my grandfather was obviously disappointed that his musical career didn't go anywhere, but I wonder if he looked back at his life with some success. I think that, there would be a little of both combination. Speaking from personal experience, I think that there's some some level of regret that goes along with that. Uh, when you uh, arrive at a certain point in your lifetime, you realize, oh, <laughs> you know, this is it. Uh, I missed my I missed my shot. So what you do is you just carry on and do what you can from that point forward. You know, uh, pay the bills, pay the car insurance, everything. 
So uh, how most of us do that? We do that by uh, working a job, which uh, has nothing to do with music. So life gets in the way. And all of that to someone who's a musician at heart, they're all distractions. I think there was some level of regret and maybe some bitterness that he wrote this song and perhaps others that we have no knowledge about that uh, never went anywhere commercially. Yeah. All these years later, what inspired you to post the song? (laughs) Easy. Just listening to it. It's dark. It's beautiful. Well, thank you very much again. I, I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Jason. My pleasure. In future episodes of my grandfather's secret life in music, I interview my mother, who actually used to help Grandpa write his songs when she was a young girl. She reveals the many sides of her complex father. I was sitting with him, and he was laying down, and I said, I love you, Daddy. And he said, I love you, too. And that was probably the first time he told me he loved me. We learned that he was far from perfect and had to overcome a lot of adversity in his life. I will also interview my grandmother about my grandfather's extraordinary life as a child in Eastern Europe. They had a farm and it was a lot of work in the fields and dad didn't want to do that. He had to play the violin and grandpa found him and took the violin and hit him over the head with it. She even reveals a secret from his past that she didn't even know about until after they were married. When I met him, he never told me anything of his past life. All this and more on my grandfather's secret life in music. My grandfather's secret life in music is written and produced by Jason Morris, all rights reserved. Music by Nikki Kerr and my grandfather Tony. Please visit our website to hear all of our episodes and bonus material. www.mygrandfathersecretlifeinmusic.com
Cause I see 